Hello again, it's Cliff here from Down Under. Finally, we're getting some summertime down here. Um, this video has got some intriguing details on rapid turn, fourth axis, and fourth axis probing. Cheers. I want to machine a bunch of acetyl bushes with a very high precision, and I thought this would be a good job for rapid turn. And um, I found out it is really good, and I've learned a few little tricks along the way. These are the, the parts, and I'm just machining the OD, and I need them to have a high surface finish and be very accurate and parallel. So the first stage was to rough them out. I uh, CNC those out on the lathe um, with a little automatic tool changing program. Rough them out with a bit of material on the outside diameter and let them settle overnight. You may know that acetyl is extruded and it's got stresses in it and um, once it's been machined it'll slowly relax back down um, and uh, sort of stabilize at a certain shape and so it's not a bad idea to, to give it a bit of time to do that and now that it's stabilized I can finish machine it on a mandrel to some precision sizes and I, will, I should no longer get any further uh, movement or distortion uh, once that's been done. I used to do this job in a manual lathe on a mandrel and I wondered whether it would be an advantage doing it on rapid turn and yes there are several advantages and I can compare um, rapid turn with a manual lathe. So essentially I've got a little uh, mandrel which is um, size for size on the reamed out uh, bushes and just a tiny little bit of uh, if I can show you there, a slightly larger diameter just at the very end just to provide a little bit of friction. You don't need much grip, that's, that's just gripping on there enough now to take the load of cutting. So then I produced a bit of code with the conversational facility in Pathpilot and then hand edited it to improve it and there's a couple of tricks there that I learned, I'll just talk about those in a minute. So anyway let's just run apart so you can see what I'm doing. And that produces a lovely surface finish. And it's just beautiful on the diameter. I can control the parallelism and the diameter very accurately with a couple of little tricks. Normally I'd set up a tool that had chip breaking so that I didn't have to worry about manually removing the ribbon of swarf but this is just a finishing cut and it's virtually impossible to chip break something like that. And here rapid turn is better than a manual lathe because it will automatically stop and start the cycle and you're, both your hands are free to remove the uh, ribbon of swarf without having to worry about switching on the power feed and turning off the lathe and so on. So that's an advantage. Another advantage that a, a, an NC lathe has over a manual lathe is that you can really easily control the parallelness of the part. You know, if I want a 20.01 diameter um, and it's 82 millimeters long, but I can give it a destination uh, diameter of 20.05 and that will generate a taper to offset the error that I'm getting from that machining pass. So another advantage of NC turning is that in addition to the taper and parallel compensation, um, there's wear offsets in the X and the Z. So you can fine tune your diameter on the fly very easily. And that's something that's very easy to do on a CNC lathe. I'm really sold on a CNC lathe versus a manual lathe because there's all of these little advantages that I hadn't thought of. Um, the other advantage is, despite the errors in the machine, you know, and there always are errors in a machine tool, um, w w once you've compensated for them, then it repeats itself and, and, and repeats the same errors every time, obviously. Um, that's just the nature of mechanics. And so with a, with a CNC lathe, 
you can very e easily reproduce the same mechanical movements and the same errors and the offset compensations that you've put into your code repeat very accurately too and so that the repeatability is very good and quite often on a low cost CNC machine the absolute accuracy values are quite poor but the repeatability is very good often to within a tenth of a thousandth of an inch so with the compensation adjustments and the very high repeatability you if you understand what you're doing you can produce very accurate parts beautiful just come outside for some good light that's the New Zealand Pahutakawa tree in blossom in December, just before Christmas, sort of the New Zealand Christmas tree. Anyway, um, it's given a really beautiful finish. Another little trick I learned when I was just setting up the mandrel is that the 5C collet didn't run very true and I was getting a, a couple of thou run out. Um, you know, but these 5C collets are mass produced um, to pretty average tolerances to get the price down really low and they are amazingly cheap um, but what I found was that if I kept juggling it around in different positions so turned the collet around inside the uh, 5C bore um, and I, I could adjust the run out because obviously different um, eccentric errors were cancelling each other out until I got to the position where the run out was very low I mean that's um, hundredths of a millimeter so we're talking uh, less than a quarter of a hundredth of a millimeter run out there and in that position um, you can mark where is it here we are you can make a little scratch on the front of the spindle nose can you see it there yeah just you can just see it there um, so I've scratched it with a tungsten carbide scriber and across the front of the collet. So now when I, when I want to use this collet again, that's the position it goes in um, to cancel out the various errors and get good concentricity of the bore. Actually, I should mark the mandrel as well in that position. Um, although I've checked the mandrel by rotating it inside the collet and uh, doesn't seem to be much in the way of errors in the mandrel but still I should still mark that so you, you can make little tweaks um, to the low cost relatively inaccurate parts um, and they can, they can if you're careful you can you can establish um, accuracy by cancelling out errors in opposite directions so that you end up with accurate accurate work Accuracy is a fascinating subject and um, uh, it, it's never as simple as you think. I mean, what I was just talking about there sounds like um, an error in the 5C collet and an error in the uh, rapid turn spindle bore cancelling themselves out. But you can't jump to the conclusion that that's all it is. There could also be other errors and very likely are. For example, the draw tube is not a precision uh, piece of equipment and that's pulling a, a very it's a very rough tube threaded on the end of the 5c collet that's not a ground concentric thread it's likely to be several thou off center and the thrust washer and the boss of the draw tube is uh, pinned together so there's going to be all kinds of concentricity errors there and when you tighten that draw tube up it's highly likely to be pulling the 5C collet over off to one side as far as it possibly can in the clearance of the 5C spindle bore and wrenching the collet and, and springing it and biasing it and so there's all those errors as well not just the simple error of uh, the, the making of the collet or the spindle bore. I was going to support the mandrel in the end with the revolving center in my little tailstock um, but I was hoping I wouldn't have to use the tailstock because the problem with using a tailstock is that 
it stays at, a, at ambient temperature whereas the headstock gets warmer and, and rises up over time it's because it's heating in this area here and expanding upwards and um, I've got a YouTube video on that I think on the rapid turn um, series called accuracy uh, anyway um, so I was hoping I could get away with just machining it without the support of the tailstock and while that would be a problem in steel because the the number the length to diameter ratio would be getting a bit long for steel um, you can get away with it in a settle fine and you probably could in aluminium too because this way when it goes up and down it goes up and down basically a lot more parallel I suppose that uh, yeah it's heating up at both ends of the headstock so the whole headstock's going up and down um, not by much you know uh, not as much as I feared because it cools down in between each cycle and you only get uh, around about a hundredth of a millimeter or half a thou variation um, as it warms up and stabilizes and you can make that adjustment in the X wear offset as long as you're reasonably consistent with production and don't stop and start all the time filming making videos you've, you've got to remember this is a two thousand dollar CNC lathe capability we're not talking about a hundred thousand uh, dollar Nakamichi Japanese machining center here this is a two thousand dollar that's that that is a fraction of the price and for that price you're getting a lot of technology a lot of capacity um, a lot of capability and so I think it's only fair to be positive about it it's value for money regarding using a touch probe to set the work offset for the A axis um, or if you like to set the center, spindle center line to the uh, A axis center line uh, recently a new owner of uh, the Hallmark impact tolerant touch probe the ITTP contacted me about this path pilot routine and I realized that I hadn't actually noticed it there quite insignificant over on the right hand side beside the uh, horizontal finding circular boss center is the A axis finding circular boss center let's just run that probing routine now <laughs> So there you can see it's doing some vertical probes to establish the part diameter then it's doing the maths then it's wrapping over and coming down to the Z center height and probing in the Y negative and Y positive and finding the center so it's finding the center of the part in both the Z and the Y and notice also it's rotating the fourth axis and that's a good feature um, it's rotating at 180 degrees between the two key Y probes so that it takes into account any errors in the concentricity of the part so let's have a look at it on path pilot so this is the normal horizontal probing routine and the corresponding button but here we have uh, find a axis center and set work origin okay that larger piece we just tested was 45 millimeters diameter let's try it on something smaller about about a quarter inch as far as I can gather you just need to park the probing the uh, probe tip approximately in the middle of the Y and just above the part um, so let's try it at that
there we are. Very easy. Just for interest, I tried doing the probing with it a little bit off center in the Y, and we still get the same results. It's it's still capable of uh, doing the calculations. But obviously, if you've got a small diameter part, you don't want to be too far off in the Y to begin with, or this could happen. And it would just keep probing down until the body contacted the job. And although it's an impact tolerant probe, um, the body itself is not impact tolerant and, and if you didn't hit the stop switch quick enough that could be nasty. Obviously what's impact tolerant on this probe is the stylus and while I wouldn't advocate crashing it for the fun of it because it will begin to wear the internals it is very tolerant and handy to have for an emergency when something horrible goes wrong. The ITTP has got a huge amount of retract in the X and the Z but all the same, if you do have a major crash, it's a good idea just to check that it's still perfectly concentric. There you are, that's still fine, no harm done, it doesn't need to be tweaked. But if it, if it was a really major crash, you can just reset it again to get it perfectly concentric. So that's using a light finger indicator to check that the probe is still perfectly central. If you're interested in this product, have a look at my uh, playlists. I've got a series of nine videos on the ITTP and the latest one I think is part nine. Well that's probably enough for one video. I was hoping to put all of this content into one video but I think I need to split it into two, part one and part two. It's, it's a difficult balancing act. You know, we haven't got time to watch great long videos these days. So you sort of need to keep it concise and summarize a few things. But the trouble with precision engineering, if you start summarizing things too much, you start blurring the accuracy of the content. And that's not very helpful either. So I think I have to make it two videos. Um, if you're interested in an update on the ITTP, I'll put that in at the end of part two. Cheers. Mm -hmm.